Well, good morning, everyone. And to those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Michael, and I'm the curate here at St. Andrews. So as we pray together, as we begin, you might want to take a chance just to turn back to that reading in Judges 3, beginning in verse 12. So let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning conscious of our need for your help. So we ask you to open up our eyes and our ears that as we turn to your written word and hear your spoken word, you may help us encounter your living word, Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, I have good news for you all this morning. We're now only 96 days until Christmas. Only 96 days. And I wonder what you think of when you imagine waking up on Christmas morning and seeing all those presents spread out in front of you. What are you hoping might be inside? When I was a child, my family used to get really annoyed at me because I would never tell them what I wanted for Christmas. For me, all the fun was in the surprise. I didn't want to know what was waiting for me on Christmas morning. I wanted to be able to kind of poke and prod at the wrapped present to try and work out what was inside. You know, it would, there was no point wrapping it if I already knew. There's fun in the surprise. Well, this morning, we're going to be looking again at the book of Judges and at the sto that story from chapter 3 that we heard read a few moments ago. We're particularly focusing on Ehud this morning. Ehud was the second judge. And don't worry, you haven't missed a week. You, you're not imagining things. We haven't looked at the first judge, Othniel, from the start of chapter 3. But you might want to, this afternoon when you go home, take a moment just to read over that story and see how that dangerous cycle that Martin told us about last week actually played out in real life. And when we pick up the story this morning, Israel are back in their sinful ways. They're addicted to sin. They, can't, they just can't help themselves from having one more chocolate biscuit, even though they've been told not to, and even though they know it's bad for them. So we shouldn't be surprised at what happens next. The Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Israel are doing wrong, and they need something that's going to shock them, to wake them up a bit, to make them turn back to God. So God uses their enemy, King Eglon, to defeat them in battle. And the low point, the really sad part of our passage, comes in verse 14. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. 18 years, Israel stayed far away from God and instead served the evil king Eglon. 18 years is a really long time. If you think about someone who's just left school and has just gone to university, they're 18 years old. For as long as that person has been alive, Israel didn't serve God and instead served Eglon. But the first big surprise in our passage comes in verse 15. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer. Even though Israel have walked away from God, even though he sent Eglon to bring them back and they served Eglon instead for 18 years, even though it's taken them 18 years to cry out to him, the big surprise is that God, after all that, still sends them a rescuer. Why? Because God still cares. Israel are sinful and stubborn, but they're still God's special, chosen, loved people. Remember what we read last week in chapter 2, verse 18. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning. God still cares about Israel, so he sends them another judge 
this one by the name of Ehud. So our first big surprise this morning is not that Israel fell back into sin. The surprise is that God, after all that, would send them another savior. Why? Because he still cares. The second surprise is who God sends. It's not going as smoothly as when I practiced that this morning. God sends them an unlikely hero. We meet him in the second half of verse 15. Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. Now, there are two reasons that Ehud wasn't the hero that we might have expected. Firstly, he came from the tribe of Benjamin. We may re- remember that there were 12 tribes in Israel named after the 12 sons of Jacob that we read about in Genesis. Benjamin was the youngest brother. He was the smallest and weakest. And the tribe that was named after him was also the smallest and the weakest. So when Israel were expecting God to send them a savior because they have cried out to him, they might have expected this savior to come from Judah or one of the other bigger tribes, but not Benjamin. The second reason that Ehud was seen as an unlikely hero was that he was left-handed. Now, these days, we don't make a big deal out of people being left-handed. We love left-handed people. But in past times, it was a bigger deal, especially thousands of years ago when this story happened, because it was much more likely that men were going to have to go into battle and defend their country. And one of the things every good warrior needed was a strong right hand so they could wield a sword. You could fight left-handed, but it was a bit more awkward. So Ehud, from the little tribe of Benjamin, and left-handed, was an unlikely hero. It's a bit like that scene in The Hobbit, where the heroes are surrounded by goblins and wolves, and everything looks like it's going to be lost. They're about to die. And then at just the right moment, the eagles turn up, drive the enemies away, and carry them to safety. No one was expecting it to happen like that. And if you had been there at the time Ehud came, would you have thought to yourself, this is it? This is the moment where God is going to save Israel from Eglon? If you wouldn't have thought that, then you're not alone because it doesn't look like the people of Israel thought that either. What was the very first thing that happened after Ehud was chosen by God? We read it at the end of verse 15. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, when we talk about paying tribute today, we usually think of saying lots of nice things about someone either after they retire or they die. But in this story, Paying tribute is a bit like a gift that a conquered people had to send to the king who had conquered them. It was a bit like a tax that was imposed on them on all their livestock and their money and their food. It was humiliating to have to pay it. But the Israelites, who have been paying this tax for 18 years now, get Ehud to pay this year's installment. They're not expecting to be rescued anytime soon. So God has decided to save Israel again because he still cares. And he's done that by sending them an unlikely hero. Now, how is he going to rescue them? Well, our third surprise is that God is going to show us a funny way to save. He's going to show us a funny way to save. And this is where the story really starts to get fun. Because although the Israelites were just expecting Ehud to take the tribute to Eglon, pay it, say something nice about him, and then come home again, 
Ehud has other ideas. The first thing he does is to make himself a sword. We're told it's a cubit in length, which is about 18 inches. Which is about this long. He then hides his sword on his right thigh. And now that's important because any right-handed warrior would have hit their sword on their left thigh so that they could draw it easily. Ehud's left-handed, so he hides his on his right thigh where it's less likely to be discovered. Ehud then goes to Eglon and takes his tribute to him and leaves again. So far, nothing unexpected. But then things start to get interesting. First, we read in verse 17, Now Eglon was a very fat man. That's not just the teller of the story being unkind and mean. It's actually important. Next, Ehud turns back towards the palace and sends his people on without him. We read in verse 19 that he gets into the palace by saying, I have a secret message for you, O king. Now, who wouldn't be interested at that point? Who wouldn't want to hear the secret? So Eglon sends his servants away, and the two of them are alone. He thinks he's going to hear a secret, but we know better. Ehud then makes things even more interesting, really grabs his interest. In verse 20, I have a message from God for you. So Eglon stands up, ready to receive this secret message from God. And we all know what's coming now. Verse 21. And Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade. For he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. Eglon, the great and terrible king of Moab, who wanted everyone to respect him and to bow down before him, is left with a sword buried in his belly and his guts all over the floor. How the mighty have fallen. And Ehud calmly walks away and locks the door behind him. Job done. But the story doesn't end there. Next, Eglon's servants come back and find the doors locked. And they're not quite sure what to do at this point. We read in verse 24 that they thought, Surely he is relieving himself in the closet of his cool chamber. The door is locked. You can imagine there's a pretty bad smell coming out from underneath the door. And they assume that their king is on the toilet. And with a king like Eglon... It's not a good idea to barge in while he's on the toilet. So they wait, and wait, and wait. And while they're waiting, Ehud is making his getaway and getting out safely. But eventually they realize something can't be right here. Not even someone who eats as much as Eglon could spend this long on the toilet. So they get the key, open the door, and see their king there dead. Bit awkward. Now if you find yourself trying not to giggle there, it's okay. We're supposed to find this story funny. Eglon was a terrible king who ruled over Israel with an iron fist. And God has torn him down and showed him out to be the fool that he really is. It's a bit like that old story of the emperor's new clothes. The emperor is fooled by some con men who convince them that they've made him the most beautiful clothes anyone has ever seen. And then everyone else just goes along with the lie. But it takes the unlikely figure of a little boy to stand up and say, hang on, he hasn't got any clothes on. It took the unlikely figure of Ehud to show everyone, see, Eglon wasn't so great after all. It's okay to laugh. Eglon was a fool. And all that remains is for Ehud to lead Israel into battle against the Moabites. And we can read all about that victory in verses 26 to 29. 
The real high point comes in verse 30. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. How the tables have turned. So can we just close the book of Judges there and say that they all lived happily ever after? Well, not quite. We do read at the very end of our passage that the land had rest for 80 years. But that was for 80 years, not forever after. So we know exactly what's going to happen next. Spoiler alert for next week, the spiral is going to start all over again. We're going to know these words really well by the time we finish in Judges. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Again and again we're going to hear that. God had shown that he cared for Israel by sending them an unlikely hero to save them in a funny way. But it wasn't enough. Israel were still, still sinful and stubborn in their hearts. And at that point, we might be tempted to just give up, to throw our hands in the air and say, what hope is there for me? What hope is there for us stuck in this downward spiral? Maybe we think that if God hadn't lost patience with Israel by the end of the book of Judges, surely he must have lost patience with me by now, with what, everything that I've done. But we need only read through the rest of the Bible to see that giving up and refusing to show mercy is not really who God is. He is the God who loves to show mercy and to save us from our sin. No human savior could ever break us out of this downward spiral of sin, but God still cares about his people and he still loves to show mercy. So he sent the unlikeliest savior of all, he sent his own son, Jesus. And the way that salvation was accomplished was the strangest of all. For Jesus did not come to commit violence to kill an evil king. Instead, he was the good king who was the victim of violence, who died in order to save. Had we been standing there on Good Friday, we would not have expected that this this was the great moment of salvation. But then three days later, Jesus rose again. And he promises that everyone who turns back to him, no matter who they are or what they've done, will receive mercy. Mercy that will never run out. But the story doesn't end there. It doesn't just end with us for receiving forgiveness for our sins. For just after Eglon was killed, the battle with the Moabites still had to be won. Jesus, though he didn't lead his people straight into battle, we read right at the end of the Bible that he is coming again, and he will lead us into battle with the forces of darkness. And the amazing news is that he invites all who put their trust in him to be part of that great victory. In the meantime, until that day, each and every one of us can keep putting our trust in the God who loves to save us and loves to show us mercy. Because of what Jesus, the unlikely Savior, did for us, we can truly sing in our hearts those words that we're going to reflect on in just a moment. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest the vilest the power. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Let's pray together as we end. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word, and we thank you in particular for the story of Ehud that we've looked at this morning. We pray that you would write your word on our hearts and give us the grace to turn back to you to turn back from the cycle of sin that we keep throwing ourselves into. We pray that you would teach us to throw ourselves on your mercy, which is far more 
than our sins could ever be. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.